Computer monitors. Ever since the 1970s, using a computer at home, school, or work has meant directing our eyeballs toward a rectangular, brightly lit box for hour after hour. The decades have taken us from CRT tubes with a warm, heavy aesthetic to early LCDs, which first sparked hope that our computers wouldn't necessarily take up our entire desk, and further on to the vibrant 4 and 5K displays of today. Like peering deep into the great landscapes of Claude Monet, the computer monitor is a window into our digital world. But not all paintings are landscapes. Why then do our monitors need to be? One of the earliest workstations credited with sparking the graphical user interface revolution, the Xerox Alto, had a monitor which was oriented with its shorter edge upward. But somewhere along the way, computer manufacturers decided that landscape was to be the norm. But Apple, never one to leave curiosity untapped, chose to buck this trend with a display befit of its lofty nature. The Macintosh Portrait Display was released by Apple in the spring of 1989. It features elements of the Snow White design language common on Apple hardware of the time. The bezel includes the classic rainbow Apple logo on one side and a green power LED on the other. Featuring a 15-inch monochrome CRT, the display supports up to 8-bit grayscale and uses a fixed resolution of 640 by 870 at a relatively high 75 Hz refresh rate. And yes, I did say monochrome. Grayscale displays were still fairly common at this time for business and print work due to the sharper and brighter image quality that could be attained for text compared to many early color monitors. It debuted alongside the Macintosh 2CX, which at the time was the first compact member of Apple's line of desktops tailored to professionals. It made sense then that this new monitor would be positioned as a serious display perfect for the growing desktop publishing market, which Apple themselves had helped pioneer with the original Macintosh. Journalists made specific note of the portrait display's high refresh rate, which they said could help eliminate eye strain. It was Apple's first and only portrait monitor ever released in a category that came to be known as full-page displays. Similar monitors had been released for the Mac for several years by third parties like Radius, joining a wide gamut of color and grayscale display options. Full-page monitors were so called because they could display an entire 8.5x11 or A4 document at just about the expected printed size without the need to crop, zoom, or scroll around. No, friends, no more scrolling like with your average landscape monitor. You can see your entire department store flyer, magazine cover, or earnings call report without compromise. Ah, the 80s were so weird. And this was meant for folks who didn't mind paying premium prices for displays that were finely tuned to their work. At launch, the portrait display retailed for $1,099 US dollars. Adjusting for inflation, that would be just over $2,300 in 2021. Alongside the display came a matching Nubus video card, allowing a Macintosh 2 to display 1 or 2-bit grayscale. The card would set you back another $599. It could then be upgraded with more video RAM to get a whopping 8-bit color depth. Or, well, gray depth, I guess, since after all, this is still a monochrome CRT. At least the price of Apple's universal monitor stand was included in all of that. Wait, it wasn't? Oh, bother. At least Apple would never repeat that mistake again. The stand would allow the portrait display to be used at a variety of angles, but it could just as easily sit to the side or atop your favorite Macintosh model. And I have to admit, this saves some space and looks pretty darn nice. To the display's right are the brightness and contrast controls. These, like the rest of the monitor, are showing signs of yellowing from sun exposure but I'm not quite ready to attempt a retrobrite of this anytime soon. On the back is a 3-port ADB hub for keyboard and mouse, a somewhat rare 13W3 video in port, a power socket, and a very satisfying toggle power button. There's also a security lock mount, and its adjustment controls are hidden behind a small removable door. Like most monitors, connecting it to your Mac is pretty easy. Typically, you'd connect the video in to the same port on the matching new bus card, or to the 15-pin video port of later Macintosh models, like my Quadra 700, which can drive the display natively. 
By using a pass-through power cord, the Macintosh can turn the display on and off automatically. My Quadro has been upgraded with its maximum video RAM and supports 256 shades of gray. And let me tell you, the reviewers of the day were not lying. Text on this display looks awesome. Scan lines are crisp and clear. There's little to no blurring or artifacts even 30 years later. Working on a script in Microsoft Word feels like stepping into a 1980s period drama. The sound of the keyboard, the tilt of the screen. Jessica Fletcher would be proud. Another place that this display really shines is when browsing the web. Or, well, what the web was circa 1993, as shown here in Netscape Communicator. I can vividly remember a time like this when the web was newer, slower, and deeply more intimate. It was a time of late nights after school, browsing message forums and user groups talking about the latest games, movies, and shareware. But text isn't the only thing that this display excels at. Photos look especially good in rich grayscale. I'm very impressed at how much contrast the CRT still has given its age. So we've talked about work, but how about some fun? After all, one of the best parts of retro computers is playing classic games. And what better example for this tall monitor than a sim that stretches high? Or perhaps another sim that's a little more sprawling. SimCity 2000 plays very well on what, at the time of its release, was only a four-year-old display. Staring at these sprites in black and white feels strange, but familiar. And then you can never forget some of the best classic adventure games. Alright, maybe this isn't the best example. These games were made to be in landscape. But can you imagine the secret of Monkey Island in portrait full screen? There's something about seeing these games limited to the shades of gray that makes them feel, I'm not sure, darker, more mysterious, likely more difficult, but almost entirely a new experience altogether. A few even older adventure games for the Mac play just as well in pure black and white. I'm not sure what else I could say about the Macintosh portrait display. It's a curious footnote that's often forgotten in Apple's history. There's a strange sense of added wonder here, like spending childhood nights watching old black and white movies on the classic TV set at your grandparents' house. I suppose that's why I gravitate towards old tech such as this. It feels like something that exists only in a half-forgotten dream, something you think you recall, but that's just out of frame. If you need me, I'll be there in that lost 90s ether enjoying a game or two and working on my novel on this noble display. Until next time, happy restoring and thanks for watching.